Welcome to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and for this episode I'm delighted to be joined by Lisbon Lion Willie Wallace. I spoke to Willie at the Legends of Football event at Glasgow's Royal Concert Hall where he shared the bill with Jim Craig. Jim's interview will be featured on a future episode of A Celtic State of Mind. But for now, Willie chats about his journey to Celtic Park, his Lisbon Lions teammates and the two European Cup finals he played in for Celtic. He also refers a couple of times to a special guest who was in the audience that night, Danny McGrain. Danny will be joining me along with Davy Hay on the 7th of January 2019 at Glasgow's Royal Concert Hall for another Legends of Football event. You can get your tickets now at the Concert Hall's box office or on their website. But until then, please sit back and enjoy Willie Wallace with a Celtic state of mind. Tonight gives me a great pleasure to welcome onto the stage Mr Willie Wallace. All the way from Australia to come and chat to us this evening. So, Willie, if we go right back, uh, obviously we, we remember you in your prime playing for Celtic and winning European Cups and scoring goals in Scottish Cup finals, but what was your early football career? How did you get into the game? How did you get noticed? I was uh, obviously like everybody else, playing youth football, playing with schools, a club, and I joined uh, Stenage Muir in the second division. In 1957, <laughs> it's a little while ago. But uh, at that time, Stanish Muir was made up of three or four boys around from 18 to 20, and the rest were over 35. And I went to play in the Scottish Cup. The first Scottish Cup I ever played in was against Clachnacudden in the third round. And the papers had it in Inverness that Stenish Muir had bought a younger keeper. They had replaced a guy called Archie McFeet. He was only 38. <laughs> <laughs> and they had bought a new keeper from Press North End, Stan Gullen. And he was 39. <laughs> so we were going up the way, you know. So, but the average age of that team was so oh, around about. 32 somewhere, you know. And it was at the time when they brought in flu injections. Right. And uh, they took us in two at a time, and it was an old guy who used to play for Celtic, actually, and most people wouldn't remember him. But he played with Celtic and Hamilton Ackies called Rab Quinn. And Rab was the old uh, centre-half. How sharp that pass. And uh, if he missed it, the guy next to him got it. And we were standing next to the doctor, and the doctor said, yeah, Mr. Quinn, age. He says, get him out of the room before I tell you. <laughs> because I was only 17, he was 30 odds, you know. But it was a fantastic experience for me to be in among these uh, senior players, guys who had played upstairs and on their way back down. And... A lot of nasty tackles went on in these days. And I was fortunate enough to get an education in how to use my body mm -hmm. as a player. And it stood me in good stead over the years. And you were a prolific goal scorer wherever you went, Willie. When did the, the interest come from Wraith Rovers? Because I've looked at the, the team that you played in. It was, a, it was an excellent Wraith Rovers side that you joined. Yes. And you played alongside some fantastic players in Kirkcaldy. I did, yes. And uh, there was another young guy, same age as me, Jim Baxter. Mm -hmm. Turned out to be not a bad player either. He's all right, aye. But uh, Jimmy was a minor son, you know. And, <laughs> well, actually, I don't think many people know it, but Jimmy was ad adopted right. as a young kid. And his parents were real fifers. Come in the new son, you know. <laughs> you'll have a wee boiled egg. <laughs> and that was the type, you know, they were just a, a terrific family. But Jimmy's talent was fantastic. He didn't want to go to Rangers. He wanted to stay because he didn't know any better at that time, you know. But he went on to be. But they were... Guys like, I uh, don't know whether people remember him, Willie McNaught was the captain. He, if I wanted to have a wedge 
as a golfer, I would have the left foot. He could place the ball anywhere with his left foot. But I don't know whether people in here agree with me or not, but it was very difficult to enter the Scottish team in these days if you didn't have a blues jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so we had probably three or four guys, Andy Lee, Neely Mockin, his brother Dennis, and a guy called Willie Poland, who were all, I thought, as good as what was getting in at that time mm-hmm. to the Scottish team. Because was uh, Dennis, was he left back, was he? He back? was, yeah, Dennis, he was a good Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I knew the, the Mockin family uh, as a boy. You know, I used to pick Dennis up. I had a little A30, uh, Pride and Joy. I'd seen a lot of things happen in his life, but I went through to Kirkcaldy every day from Kirkintar, and I picked up Dennis, and we would go through, and he was just like Neely, you know, and the whole family were, and his old father used to like Danny Boy, and every morning again it was playing on the radio or something, I must have a record or something, but he loved Danny Boy, he's a man from the West Country. You mentioned... Um Jim Baxter, obviously from my neck of the woods. And there's a beautiful statue in Hill Beef for anybody who ever fancies going and having a look at that. Um, looking down at uh, every passing vehicle into the, the village. But obviously, the reason I say that is because, you know, we've got our Lisbon Lions and we've got statues to celebrate their successes. And next month, one of the guys on this jersey, Bobby Lennox, his statue will be unveiled in Salt Coats. So it's only fitting that, that we can celebrate the achievement of the Lisbon Lions in such a way. Yeah. So, Willie, where, where are we going to put your statue? Uh, a graveyard, probably. <laughs> uh, you're talking about Hillabeath. You're not from Hillabeath, are you? Just down the road. Yes. Aye. I had a very, very close friend who died a few years, David Daly. Did you know the Daly? I don't know. Lawrence Daly was a famous reunion man. With Scargo, everybody remember Scargo? Remember Scargo, eh? Yeah. Well, the Daly, the Daly family were very, very strong union people. Mm-hmm. And I met this little fella out in, uh, in Oz, and the funniest little guy I ever met. And my fifth, 60th birthday came along last year. <laughs> and he gave me a, a birthday card, 65. I says, what's happened here? He says, I'll do you five years. <laughs> <laughs> so it must have been for you, yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello, Beef, yeah. yeah. Um, but again, looking at, down at your career, as you say, there were some players in that Wraith Rover side who mm. should have been playing for Scotland. You were prolific yourself, Willie. And uh, at any point, did Celtic or Rangers show an interest in you? Not really at that time. I was played as an outside right. Uh, Ray Throwers and it was a guy called Jackie Stewart who had played down in England with Birmingham City and he came back and he was the first coach I ever had and he came back and he would have the young guys back in the afternoon and it was the first time I ever got involved in what they called shadow football he would have have us playing in our own positions crossing balls doing all sorts and it improved us out of sight and Jimmy was one of them, mm-hmm. Jimmy Baxter. And we had a trainer there who had won the Powder Hall Sprint. Right. He ran under the name of Willie Black, but his actual name was Willie Hunter. He was an Edinburgh guy. And he used to race Jim every day. And Jim never ever beat him. <laughs> now, I've, I've heard some people mentioning that uh, Jimmy Quinn at Celtic was probably mm. the, the quickest player. He was, uh, yeah. was he up there with the quickest players you ever played with? Yeah, well, young Jim, uh, Jimmy and Pat McMahon, uh, Pat McCluskey, they used to come to my house and uh, we would drive in with me. They lived in Croy, right. so I was in, in Condorit, and Jim mentioned the name George Conway. George would drive through from H, what is it, Jim? <laughs> High Valley yeah. Field. And uh, he was mentioning about him wretching H for years. And we were coming through Glasgow Airport one time and we had to fill in a little form of re entry. And he was filling it in and he says to Bertie, Here's a bit here that just says sex. 
Well, he says, just put in twice a week. <laughs> You're laughing, he did. So your, your journey continued, and yes. um, your next stop, Willie, was at Hearts. Yes. And yet again, the success that you enjoyed at Hearts was was quite fantastic. What's your memories of Tynecastle back then? They were all good. I was at Tynecastle six years, six and a bit. And fortunately, unfortunately, I always managed to play well against Celtic at Tynecastle. When uh, also at Ibrox, I, I've got a, quite a few goals at Ibrox as well. It wasn't just one sided. But when I, mean, I went there, there was a guy there, John Cummings, who was a captain, another one who was oh, grossly missed when it came to international matches. He would be one of the best tacklers that I've ever seen in football. When he tackled you, your bones shook. But he could tackle you fair, you know, he, was, he wasn't a dirty player or anything. But uh, he, he, you remember Dave Mackay? Well, Dave Mackay and him were the both, they were tremendous players. <laughs> Around the early 60s, they won the league and they won the cup and they were a very, very good team. When I went there, and a guy called Willie Balls, I don't know if you remember him, but he was top scorer at that time. And he was a guy, when he rose to head a ball, he just hung there. He hung in the air. That was always my desire. She struck me the size of me, you know. I had to climb over them to get it. I just wanted to do the same as him. He was magnificent in here. Again, it was part of my education, just coming through the, the ranks. But what you can do this evening, Billy, you can give us a, a unique insight because you played against many of the Lisbon Lions as mm. a Hearts player. So yeah. what's your memories of playing against this team and who stood out for you? Oh, Celtic, it's always a difficult game for us. It didn't matter if we play away at home or away. But in the, I remember, actually, I've got the, the programme at home. The first game I played for Hearts was the second last game of the season. And I was allowed to play because there was no relegation or promotion or whatever involved. And we played... Glasgow Celtic at Parkhead and beat them 3 2. And there was 3,500 at the game. Wow. So that was 1961, mm -hmm. 60 61. But many of the they, they were a good side then, but they just didn't seem to win. Mm -hmm. But that, that's, uh, I was just going through my old. There's a cupboard there full of old tales, you know, and when I get depressed, I read some. And I think I'm reading about Roy and Rovers, you know. <laughs> when I wake up and it's me, you know. Now, back then, it was, it was slightly different because there were no agents. Um, so how did you find out about Celtic's interest when they finally signed you in December 1966? Well, I had spoken to Newcastle and Stoke City on... Uh, wages and different things which my good lady all of us knew nothing about you know and I, I was training uh, on a, I think it was a Tuesday and I came home to come and all the phone rang it was John Harvey the manager of Hearts he said would you like to go into Parkhead and talk to Celtic they would like to sign you right out of the blue. I had never even heard of anything about it. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. He said, well, you go in. Mr. Steen would like to see you at four o'clock. We'll be there at five o'clock. But don't say anything to the Hearts directors because it was a bit illegal. <laughs> so, but, yeah. <laughs> so I went through, drove through from Cumbernauld to uh, Parkhead and if you've been in through the front door at that time, as Daniel remembers as well, John Thompson's picture was up there. So I was sitting there for a little while on the couch, and Mr. Steen came out and he said, Oh, come in, you're there, you know, and so I was sitting there, and 
the chairman was there and Jock. And I, I knew nothing about it. I had no idea. And he said, would you like to join Celtic? I said, yeah. But I had played under Jock with Scotland. I'd played a game, one game. And then he asked me the question, why? Would you like to play with Celtic? I thought, well, you're going well. And Celtic, to me at that time, the squad of players that were there, and the way they were in the league, and it was everything. It was a positive. It was November. And I said, yeah, I would. I said, OK. So he told me the wages, and he told me what they were prepared to give me. And within five minutes, I was sitting under John Thompson again, because I just didn't agree with what I was offered. Right. So the directors arrived with John Harvey from Hearts and came in, and he says, John Harvey says, how did it go? How did it go? I says, I didn't sign. Oh, well, his hair went grey. So they went away into the boardroom, and within 20 minutes, he came out and said, told me a deal which I accepted. But they signed me on a six-month contract. So I played from November to April, I think it was, when I used to finish the contract for the first six months on a six-month contract. So I said, well, what, what happens? And John Harvey says, well, sign it. If nothing works here, come back to Hearts. So I was quite fortunate. I started off well enough and had a good six months. You certainly did. Now, yeah. the thing is, Willie, obviously the, the guys here went white because it was a record transfer fee. Um, <laughs> is that the kind of thing that puts any added pressure on a footballer, or is it something you didn't no. think about? I, you know, I used to like to read fairy stories, you know. But reading about that transfer was one of the biggest fairy stories I've ever read. <laughs> because... They had an offer, 80,000 from Newcastle and Stoke, and I went for 28,000. Mm-hmm. Would you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, to this day, I don't know what the fee was. It was never disclosed. I was just happy to get to sign and mm-hmm. get join the club. Yeah. I'd, uh, I've spoken to some players who had been playing with other Scottish clubs because most of the players that signed for Celtic were domestic signings. And uh, there always seems to have been a step up uh, when, when you eventually joined Celtic. You were joining from a very, very good heart side. Mm. What was the biggest differences when you came to Celtic Park, Willie? Uh, no, no great deal of difference. Because at Hearts we had a good group of players. And at Celtic Park, they were a great group of players. It didn't take me... Two weeks to settle in. I was in there and, and I was lucky enough to, to score in the first game I played. So that sort of lifts the pressure off you a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of people were on the understanding that I was there to replace somebody. I wasn't. I was there just to compete for a position. Yeah, and bolster it. Uh, just. Uh, uh, People thought it was Joe and I were going to be the partnership and Steve, you know, I mean, we've got to remember Yogi was there as well at the time and there was, we could have maybe have four people we could have played up front, but I was bought just as a player to join the squad. Yeah, and who was your uh, roommate when you, you were travelling to away games? Uh, generally it was big TG, you know, <laughs> but for some reason he changed me in Lisbon. And Kearney, I think you were with Tommy Gamble, and I got the maestro. I got wee Betty. <laughs> <laughs> and the st- uh, uh, it was after the game, I don't know if Elizabeth and all of remember, they went to the airport, and we went to the airport with them. And it was mobbed, it was packed, and everybody saw we, because the players were there, the crowd was going mad, and we just saw them in to get their plane and we were going back down to Estoril on the bus. And the guy who licked Jim's eyes, <laughs> Bob Rooney, we were staring down this mountainside and he covered the driver's eyes with his hand. <laughs> it's true. 
<laughs> we all gone, oh, <laughs> you know, they were trying to get it back and roll. But we get back down there and they said, okay, the gym's good mate, he's a roommate, see, he's not a good guy to sleep with because he let Big Tom go to the casino. <laughs> <laughs> and Bertie and I, like good boys, went to her bed. But Bertie didn't tell me at the time. His brother, his brother needed somewhere to sleep. He had been tossed out of his hotel. So we had a big walk-in robe, and I said, you can sleep in there, or lock the door. So we put Bertie's brother in there, locked the door, and the next word we got, the wives have arrived. The plane's not leaving. Oh, fuck. Bertie says, don't say a word. My missus will go spare. <laughs> so we're lying on the beds. They'd come in the room, and Liz said, oh, to Bertie, and all you could hear was... <laughs> Who's that? That's John Clark next door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay. Then he must have passed wind. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? John Clark. <laughs> so they, I don't know how long they waited, and then somebody phoned up and they all went back on the bus again to go back up the road. So I said, Betty, what's wrong with him? What happened? He says he was put out of the hotel for a simple reason. All he wanted to do was cook tea. So I said, well, did he, did he have a stove or anything? She said, no, no, he broke up a couple of chairs and set a fire in the room. <laughs> oh, I said, that's handy. That'd be nice. <laughs> we could go camping here. <laughs> I said, you're joking. Just open the door out. <laughs> Threw him out. I don't know where he went to, but he's, he's still around somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, prior to Lisbon, yeah. Willie, obviously, if you hadn't already made your mark, he certainly did in the Scottish Cup final. Yeah. Now, that lineup was the, the team that went out and played in Lisbon. So, what's your I memory to that Scottish Cup final? The two yeah, he didn't get a penalty away that day. No, he didn't, you know. <laughs> uh, it was a good friend of mine, actually, Jimmy Story, and I went to school together. Jimmy Aberdeen Leeds. Uh, God rest his soul, he's passed on now. But him and I played football from the age of 12, right through uh, first class juvenile, junior football and everything. And he played in the opposition that day, so. And scoring the two goals uh, <laughs> lifted a fantastic button off me, you know. So I'd paid down the three quid they paid for me. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did they deal with your, uh, your contract, your six-month contract, when it came up to April? Well, it cost them a few more because they wanted to offer me a three-year contract after mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, I benefited out of it, really. Yeah. What was the thinking behind that, rather than uh, giving you at least listen, one year? Jim and Danny will tell you, I didn't have a crystal ball that Jock had. But how, how they thought it these days, I couldn't tell you. Now, you, you mentioned uh, your roommate for the Lisbon trip, Bert. Uh-huh. And there's a famous story, of course, when you're lined up in the tunnel and you've got the, the Scottish guys with the ginger hair and, yeah. you know, the, the, the falsers are going in Ronnie Simpson's hat. Yeah. And you look over and the Inter Milan guys are like film stars with the tan and the greased hair. The bill team. Aye. And Bertie starts singing a song. Which, I mean... Was it uh, Sash, was it? I, <laughs> no, it was not. It was not. <laughs> What did that do to you and your teammates? Oh, it lifted us. I mean, uh, we, these, and I think Jim would agree that they played in a certain way and that was it. When they scored, they still played away the same way. But when we equalised, they couldn't change. They, I think when it went 1-1, one, one, they just, they were gone. But uh, singing the song did certainly lift us all on that. But it's uh, it's a song. Sorry? It was a song. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> we sing song. I can't, but I'll play it in the flute. <laughs> No, it was uh, the Celtic song, wasn't it, Jim? Celtic song, yeah. How's that go again? <laughs> That's it. 
Hij is nog bert, joh. Hij is Ja. Nou, het is een amazing. Uh, these guys just looked all like film stars. Ja. Yeah. En, uh, well, you'd be Jimmy on the floor, you know. En, you'd be Jimmy looking at him, look at the size of him, must be. You know, look at him, look at him, but, uh, he was, uh, a fear. He, he was good enough for anyone. It was part, it's part of the folklore of the club, you know, with Bertie singing that song. And always, I mean, I've watched that game so many times, and mm. there's a moment where Ronnie Simpson back heels the ball. Mm. Um, I mean, what are you thinking at that point? Were you so uh, confident at that stage that you were going to overcome that one goal deficit? Well, that the keeper could back heel the ball like that? I don't, I, no, I, I don't know what was in Ronnie's mind at that time. He was maybe needing a wee drum or something. You know? <laughs> he, uh, he did it, and Fortunately, there was nobody around to pick it up. But uh, I, I never even thought about it at the gate, you know. I think it's years after, and you sit down and you look at it and you say, how stupid is that? <laughs> you know, well, how dangerous was that? But uh, it, it, during the game, I'm sure Jim would agree that it was no different than playing in other games we were played in, was it? Really. We just went about what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to do a job that day, and so was Stevie, uh, and it was to occupy them back three a bit, try and push them into the box. And the guy, the after had worked out who would score from the edge of the box, and that's what we did, you know. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, he, he sat down in, down in the dressing room and he said, how do you think? I said, well, I don't think I played as well as you know, I'd like to have played. He says, you did what I wanted. That was it. Mm -hmm. Now, after the game, the, the, obviously the iconic image is of Billy McNeil going up to get that big cup, or the cup with the big ears. Well, that's the thing that I think we all missed, mm -hmm. was the presentation yeah. for that. What was the reason for that, Willie? Well, the crowd coming on the park was for the start. I finished up. Jim talked about something early, jock straps. That's what I walked into the dressing room in. <laughs> I lost the jersey, pants and socks. <laughs> I lost everything. I walked in and we bet he says you're looking well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I went in there and just as I was going in the door, the guy catches me on the shoulder. And this was a little guy, Ian Martin from Kirton Tor. And he says, Willie, Willie, can you help me? I says, What happened? He says, I've been pickpocketed. I've lost my passport, the three of us lost passports and all our money. And big Tony, I'm a big jock, so you know, I don't, you slipped up there, Kearney, Tony. But big jock was right behind me and he says, what's the problem? I says, the boys have lost all their money. They got nipped up. And true story, he handed them 200 quid and they paid it two weeks later. It sells it back. Mm -hmm. And that all happened right after the game at the dressing room door and I was in wonder pants. <laughs> <laughs> so a slight disappointment with the presentation and, and well I was, I was disappointed. Yeah. We would like to have gone up and yeah. received the cup and did the parade and all that, you know. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. a show off, you see. Yeah. But it's a beautiful image of Big Billy taking that. Yeah, that it was, yeah, I mean, it was it was a nice stadium for it. It was the ideal home and sort of theatre style thing that would have been nice to mm -hmm. sort of play around it but it didn't take away the fact that we won it No. Yeah. now uh, not to take away the focus from that game but Jim mentioned earlier the, the differences and the changes between 67 and 70 well, mm. you played in both games in your opinion what was the, the issues with that second game uh, or were you simply beaten by a better team on the, on the night I think we were beaten on the day and it were a good side I don't think there were a team that we couldn't have beat. But I think the attitude was all different. The whole thing was different. And going to Peterhead was a tremendous idea for the fact that the lifeboat had sank and the one family had been virtually wiped out. Mm -hmm. And we played a, a, a you know, charity game for it. But there was a lot of there was a couple of bad things happened there. And you're talking about managers. I don't know if Jim remembers it or not. But at that time, the playing group were talking about getting a single manager. 
should do some negotiating. Jim was talking about the painting stripes on his boots to play in the first European Cup final. So we were hoping that we would make something out of the second one. And there was talk about having a manager, mm -hmm. which didn't happen because Chop just put the kibosh on it. Yeah. So there was a wee bit, not bad blood, but different feeling about it all. Mm -hmm. I think there was the, the sense that England had won the World Cup in 66 and the players yes. were able to uh, maximise their earnings from that. Yes. 68, Man United done the same with the European yeah. Cup. It, it is. It's, and the company, I mean, I, I finished up in the, in the sports trade and I know the kind of money that's spent out on promotional stuff like yeah. that. And, well, it, it just didn't happen for us. Mm -hmm. And they, they wanted it to happen in the second game. But it, it, it didn't. It, it should never have made any difference to us, but there was a wee bit. It just wasn't the same as it was when we went to Lisbon. Thank you to Lisbon Lion, Willie Wallace, for taking the time to speak to a Celtic state of mind. All of our podcasts, articles and video content is now found on intocreative.co.uk. This site encapsulates our love of Celtic, music, books, film, politics and much more. Pay us a visit, check out our shop for merchandise and contribute your work and ideas to the site. As always, thank you all for listening. Join us again next week where we will have another guest with a Celtic state of mind. 